now I'm just going to show to you how to get a regret bound for multiplicative weight updates using this very general theorem, you know, just directly. Uh, for this, let me first make a couple of more comments on this formula. So in particular, this Bregman divergence with the Fenchel dual, this you can really, it is actually equal to say one half of the local norm of the difference between those two things. So eta gt norm squared at some point, let's call it uh, wt or maybe wt is not great, omega t dual for some omega t such that grad phi of omega t is in the segment grad phi of x t minus eta g t grad phi of x t. Okay, this is just using uh, the fact that by Taylor theorem, you know, the, the order that you make when you do the first order uh, expansion is equal to the second derivative evaluated at some point on the segment between the two points that you're taking the first order approximation. Okay, this is all it's saying. And the reason why it's a, it's a dual point like this, it's because this Bregman divergence, you remember, uh, it's erased, but it was somewhere here, it's here. You remember, you have this formula that the Hessian of uh, phi star is the inverse Hessian of phi. Joel, what is it that uh, you can... Uh, it's just hard to read. Yeah. Up too far away. Yeah, so again, all I'm saying is that, and it's in red also, which is not great. Uh, all I'm saying is this Bregman divergence term is exactly uh, a local norm dual evaluated at some point omega t, which is not xt. So that's the point. This point omega t is not xt. We would like it to be xt. You know, this was, again, it's erased now, but this is the fourth miracle. The fourth miracle is when you do the continuous time analysis, you really get the second order derivative is equal to this term, local norm evaluated at xt. Now, in discrete time, you have some error. It's not evaluated exactly at xt. It's evaluated at some omega t, which is on a dual segment. Okay, so the grad phi of omega t lies somewhere in the segment grad phi of xt minus eta gt, grad phi of xt. Okay, um, so let's use that. Okay, so a corollary of this is the following. So let me, let's see what happens if, if phi is a separable function. So in particular, if uh, phi of x is equal to the sum over i for i equals 1 to n, of let's say phi of xi. Okay, so if we are in the much simpler case where we have a separable mirror map, which is all we have been seeing so far. Okay, so far we didn't see any fancy uh, multivariate mirror map. They were all separable functions. So in this case, uh, what do I want to say? I want to say the following. Uh, mm, Maybe, yeah, then I want to say the following. What is this? Uh, okay, let me just see how to say it. Sorry. Uh, grad phi. Right. So then what is this local norm of GT? local norm at omega t dual uh, squared. This is nothing but the sum for i equals 1 to n of g t i squared divided by phi double prime of x i of omega t i. 
And what do we know about omega ti? We know that phi prime of omega ti is in the set phi prime of x t i minus eta g t i phi prime of x t i. Okay, what I'm going to give you is some very simple condition to make sure that you can replace omega t by x t. And this will make all the calculations much nicer. So again, the local dual norm is just a Euclidean norm with you know, the coordinate, the axis rescaled by 1 over the double derivative of, of phi. And I know that omega t is such that phi prime of omega t lives in this set. Now assume, so phi is convex, right? Phi is convex. So phi prime is increasing, right? That's, that's the definition of convexity. Phi double prime is uh, non-negative. So if GTI is itself non-negative, I know that omega TI is smaller than XTI. So if GTI is non-negative, then omega TI is smaller than XTI. Right, because if omega ti was strictly bigger than xti, then phi prime would be strictly bigger than phi prime of xt, which is not our assumption. Okay, so in particular, if phi double prime is decreasing, uh, if phi double prime is increasing, is decreasing, if, sorry, if phi double prime is increasing, then this whole term is going to be smaller uh, than when it's evaluated at XTI. Okay? If phi double prime is decreasing, okay, so this thing is increasing, so then if, if, this whole, if 1 over phi double prime is increasing, then when I evaluate it at XTI, this is bigger. If I, so if phi double prime is decreasing, then, and we have that the GTIs are non-negative, then the norm of GT at omega t dual squared is in fact smaller than the norm at xt. OK, and this is very nice. We're going to like this a lot. OK, so now. The continuous time analysis and the discrete time analysis are actually exactly the same, provided that you make this, this assumption on phi. Okay, so let me just write this corollary again. Okay, so summary. So so let so corollary. If GTI is non-negative for any T and any I, and phi is such that, so it's convex, okay, so phi double prime is non-negative, and we also assume that phi triple prime is non-positive, then we have the following guarantee, the sum for t equals 1 to capital T, of the, so the regret is bounded by the Bregman divergence term between y and x1 over eta plus, and here we have exactly the uh, dual local norm, the sum for t equals 1 to capital T of the local norm of gt at xt dual squared. In fact, you get even an eta over 2. Okay, so this theorem is like, great, very nice to use. So let's use it. A any, any question on this? So you see, 
Yeah? Phi double prime is supposed to be increasing or decreasing? Phi double prime is supposed to be decreasing. So phi triple prime, right? Because uh, 1 over phi double prime, if phi double prime is increasing, 1 over phi double prime is, if phi double prime is decreasing, 1 over phi double prime is increasing. So at this value, it's smaller than at that value. And this is part of something much more general. Like this is the baby version of something very interesting, which is, again, for bandit, and we're going to do it soon, you will want like the relation between this and the local norm. You have to argue something about the higher order derivatives of your uh, mirror map. And what we're saying here is that if you have some kind of third order control on phi, then you can actually argue that this thing is the same thing as the local norms. So this foreshadows the use of what's called self-concordant barriers in, in bandits. And I will say a little bit more about this maybe later in this hour. OK, so finally, the, the bound. So now application. with uh, phi of s, which is s log s. OK, so phi double prime of s is 1 over s. And phi triple prime of s is minus 1 over s squared. OK, so this is negative, and this is uh, positive. OK, so it verifies these assumptions. So what do we get? We get that the regret, sum for t equals 1 to capital T. Let's say now we, you know, we're not in this general setting anymore. I mean, we're, we're doing prediction with expert advice, so let me specialize it with LT. Oh, and let me make also a, one more simplification, which is this Bregman here. This is phi of y minus phi of x1 if x1 is the argmin uh, or is bounded by this, if x1 is the argmin of phi of x over x in k. Okay, so if your starting point is the minimizer of your mirror map, then this Bregman divergence is bounded by this. This is again lemma 1, just the fact that the gradient is negatively is positively correlated with any direction going inside. Okay, so I really just get the difference of phi of y minus phi of x1. Yeah. Okay, so we get the following. The sum of lt dot xt minus y. This is upper bounded by what? Okay, so we get uh, phi of y minus phi of x1. Um, Phi of y is uh, non-positive, okay? It's s log s. I mean, actually, phi, yeah, phi of y is non-positive, non so I only get minus phi of x1. So I get minus the sum of x1i log x1i over eta, sum for i equals 1 to n, plus eta times uh, the local norm, so the eta over 2, the sum for t equals 1 to capital T of the local norm, which is xti, right? Because it's 1 over phi double prime, which is just s, times lti squared. OK, this term by Jensen inequality is just smaller than log n. This term is smaller than log n. This is just the, the maximal 
Shannon entropy over a discrete distribution on endpoints. So we get log n over eta plus eta over 2, the sum for t equals 1 uh, to capital T of xti lti squared. So in particular, and, and this is, let's call this a regret, in particular, rt is smaller than log n over eta plus eta over 2 t, right? This is in 0, 1. This is in 0, 1. Uh, no, sorry. This, and there was a sum over i. This is in 0, 1. And the sum for i equals 1 to n of the xti is 1. OK, so this is bounded by like this, which if I optimize over theta, over eta is square root t over 2 times log n. This bound is actually optimal even up to the constant. Okay, this is just the best you can hope for. Again, this is an exercise. I don't want to talk too much about lower bounds in this course. Uh, it's actually super simple, but uh, never mind. Um, so you see, it's like a straightforward application of this general lemma. But in fact, we even get more. We even get this, uh, this type of bound that scales with the loss of the best action. Yes, please. So what about the hypothesis that uh, GT should be put on mega GT? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so here I'm doing, so this is this, and we are in the setting where LT is in 0, 1 to the n. Right, so if the loss can take negative values, then you need something slightly different. So all of this can be done, but it's not as elegant. But it, it's going to be necessary eventually. I will. Mm. Basically, what you need is that if it can take, so here we, this is this very cute trick that if it's uh, non-negative, everything is very nice. But if it can be negative, then instead of saying that phi triple prime should be non-negative, we'll say that it has to be not too big which is exactly self-concordance. Self-concordance is exactly saying that the triple derivative is bounded by the second derivative. And if you have that, then you have everything. But here it's a setting where it's even easier. You just need non-negative. OK? So let me say again, we get something even better. We get even better. So if I denote lt to be uh, the sum of lt dot xt and l star to be the sum of lt dot y, what do we get? Because lti is between 0 and 1, lti squared is actually smaller than lti. So we, in fact, get lt minus l star is upper bounded by uh, log n over eta plus eta over 2, t, uh, not t, sorry, lt, which I can rewrite as, if I put it on the other side, a lt minus l star. OK, so I put 1 minus eta over 2. So I get here, I, I will have plus eta over 2 uh, l star. Uh, and 1 over 1 minus eta over 2 times log n over eta. OK, so all I'm saying is just up to this multiplicative constant, you know, whether it's L star, uh, whether it's LT on the right-hand side or L star, it's the same thing. OK, so which implies that the regret is bounded up to some constant by square root L star log n. OK, and I want you to understand this as some kind of adaptivity. This is a, a baby type of adaptivity, but uh, this will be the, the fifth uh, miracle tomorrow. We're going to prove something much more powerful and and let me say right away that the fifth miracle is the one that I understand the less. So in particular, I don't understand the full scope of adaptivity for mirror descent. And I think it goes 
much beyond what we currently understand, but this is one example and we'll see more tomorrow. So again, this is just saying if the best action has a small loss, then in fact you get a much better regret. And let me say something because you might say, okay, what if L star is zero? Do we really get regret zero? No, because in this optimization, you know, I cannot, if L star is zero, then I still get this term log n over eta. So really I should write this plus constant log n. And this is actually optimal. So the original paper on online learning, uh, going back to the 60s, they were caring about the case where L star would be zero. And you want to say you don't make more than log n mistakes to track who is the best. Very closely related to the log n in a metrical task system. Anyway, um, right? So you have this added constant because if this was really tiny, tiny, then I cannot take the best eta. Okay. Uh, all right. And you saw it was like uh, yeah, straightforward application. Once, of course, you have defined everything properly. All right, so now let's move on to bandits, where this local norm is going to be much more useful than simply giving an, an adaptivity bound. It's going to be like, you know, uh, crucial. If you didn't have that, you wouldn't get anything. OK, so multi-arm bandit. So this is in a problem which is in the same setting as a prediction with expert advice. So you have n actions. You're going to select one of them at each time. There is a loss between 0 and 1 uh, for every action. And uh, the only difference is that at the end of the round, you don't observe the full loss function. You only observe the loss of the action you played. So it's prediction with uh, expert advice, except that instead of observing um, LT, you observe LT of IT. IT is the action you played. OK, so this is a whole family of problem. You know, here we do it in the very simple case where you have a finite set of action. We're going to look at something more general soon. But this is called bandit feedback. So basically, you have a, an entire loss function, but you only see the value of the function at the point that you played, which makes a lot of sense. Okay, so the typical applications for this are uh, ad placement. So you imagine that you have a bunch of ads. These are your actions. And you know, a user come on your website. The user is this loss function. And what you're going to do is that you're going to choose an ad, present the ad to the user, and you will see whether the user clicks or not. But you don't know what would have happened if you had shown another ad. OK, so ad placement is really uh, bandit feedback, which is why you know this model had the renewed interest in the 2000s. But in fact, it goes back to Robbins uh, 51. OK, and there is a huge literature on this in the 70s in the Bayesian framework, which I don't want to get into. Uh, and this model, the non-stochastic version, uh, it goes from, is, uh, so non-stochastic is from the 90s. OK, that's all I want to say on the history. So let's see how to solve this problem optimally, uh, very easily, using what we did. OK? And the optimal solution is, is uh, was only known like a bit less than a decade ago. So it took a long time, but if, you had, if we had all of this before, we would have found it much quicker. OK, so um, any question on the problem itself? So what's the problem? The problem is that you cannot just do, I mean, what do you do mirror descent on? What is the GT that you use? What is the gradient that you use? You only have one value, one scale of value. OK, so question.
what is GT? Well, the point is, because you select this action IT at random, you can actually have an unbiased estimator of GT. And, and Joel already talked about this. It's just uh, importance uh, reweighting or propensity score estimation or whatever you want to call it. So here is the answer. The answer is take GT i, which is the following. It's LTI, okay, so that's what you would like to get, but you don't get LTI. You only get it at the action that you played. So for i equals it, you get it. But then I need to reweight so that it's going to be correct in expectation. So I reweight by xti. Okay, this thing has the property that the expectation of gti, expectation with respect to it sampled from xt, this is equal to lti. Okay, this is an unbiased estimator of the loss. So again, just for the action that I haven't observed, for the ad that I didn't present, I just assume it was as good as it could be. Okay, so in terms of loss, it had loss zero. And for the one that I actually played, you know, I get some loss, but I need to reweight for all these other times, fictitious time, where, you know, I wouldn't have played it and I would have assigned a loss of zero. So I need to do this reweighting. 1 over XTI. And as Joel was saying, you know, what is terrible about this? Can you remind me what's terrible about this? The variance. Variance is awful. But here you're saved because of this term. The local norm. The local norm saves the day. The local norm just completely cancels the variance. It kills the variance. So, yeah. Let me do the calculation. So here, really, if you just add you know, a Euclidean norm, let me just, again, make it clear. If you just add a Euclidean norm, so there would be no XTI, just the sum of those things squared. So one of the squares is going to get canceled by the expectation. I will explain that in, the, in a minute. But in general, you have 1 over XTI, and XTI could go to 0. So this would blow up. So if you were just doing gradient descent, it's not that you get a dimension-dependent factor. It's that you get nothing. Of course, what you can say is, yeah, but can I lower bound maybe the probability by, the, by a little bit to make sure that I play each action enough? Yes, you can do that. And then you're going to get not square root t, but t to the 2 third as a rate. OK, so let's do the calculation. Um, so what is the calculation? So the question is, what is, so regret analysis. Of multiplicative weights update with, uh, with uh, propensity score, let's call it like that, propensity score estimation. OK, so this algorithm has a name in the literature. This is called EXP3. For exploration, exploitation, with exponentials, I guess. Uh, right, I didn't emphasize this enough, but you know, because I, I'm like down in the equations. But philosophically, what's the difficulty of bandits? The philosophical difficulty, the conceptual difficulty, is that the actions that you don't observe, you know, they might be very good. So you don't know, you know, you didn't play them. So even though there is some action that you believe is really good right now, and you want to play it, you still need to explore the other action to make sure that you're not missing on something which is great out there. And because we're in this non-stochastic framework, it's very difficult because things can change over time. You know, maybe some action is very good at the beginning, 
and you want to play it, but then some other action which was bad in, in the first phase becomes excellent afterwards. So you really need to balance the exploration and exploitation in a non-trivial way. So a priori, it's not obvious that you, get, that you can get anything non-trivial in this regime. It's very easy to see that you can get at least t to the two-thirds, but that you can get square root t is kind of surprising. It's non-trivial, non I think. Uh, there is no easy argument to say that you can get square root t. OK, so let's, let's do the analysis. Uh, so we get that the regret, uh, OK, yeah, maybe. Uh, so the, what is the regret? The regret is the sum for t equals 1 to capital T of LT in a product with xt uh, minus y, let's say in expectation. Right, this is my expected regret when I play it at random from xt. Now here is the, the first trick, because gt is an unbiased estimator from lt in expectation, this is equal to the expectation of the sum for t equals 1 to capital T of gt in a product with xt minus y. Right, so what I'm saying here is that because I have unbiased estimator, Evaluating my regret on the true losses or eva evaluating my regret on the estimated losses is the same thing in expectation. But now I'm running mirror descent on the GT. So I can use the lemma, I mean the, 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 the theorem. So this I know is bounded by log n over eta plus uh, eta over 2 times the sum of those things, the sum over i and t of, what is it, x t i uh, g t i squared. OK, and there is an expectation here. Now, what is this GTI squared? This GTI squared is upper bounded by 1 over XTI squared times the indicator that IT is equal to I. Right, I just use the fact that my losses are between 0 and 1, are smaller than 1. Okay, so I get 1 over XTI squared indicator that IT is equal to I. When I'm going to take the expectation with respect to it sampled from xt, what is the expectation of the indicator that it is equal to i? That's xti. So I get one of the xti downstairs, which is cancelled in with this expectation, and the second one is cancelled by the local norm. And this is, this is why I worked so hard to make sure that I get really xti here and not some other term somewhere else. I really want those two things to match. OK, so now I really get that this is bounded by log n over eta plus eta over 2 t times n. Right? Every, every term in this sum in expectation is equal to 1, or is bounded by 1. And I have you know, the sum over t and the sum over i, so I have n t terms. OK, which when I optimize, is bounded by square root uh, t over 2 and log n. Sorry if you can't read. OK, any, any question on this calculation? OK, so this is really much simpler than all, uh, all the proofs that appeared before of this result. I mean, it's basically the same, but uh, I think it's pretty streamlined now. Um, right, and this is optimal. So it's optimal in what sense? I'm not going to prove it again because I don't want to talk about lower bounds, but it's pretty easy to see that square root tn is the best you can hope for. 
Okay, so up to this logarithmic term, this is the best you can hope for. Square root tn is the best. Okay, and maybe uh, some names. This is uh, our Peter Auer, Niccolo Cesabianchi, uh, Joa Freund, and Rob Shapiri. A very influential paper from uh, 95. So this log n comes from something, you can say, like, in, like what uh, happens in the class. OK, very good. So this log n. Uh, Doesn't seem like it. No. So this log n is actually superfluous. You can remove it. And the reason you pay for it here, it's, I mean, it's just not doing, the entropy is just not doing the, better tr the best trade off <coughs> between the range, which, you know, is log n in this case, and this variance term. You can do a better trade-off than that. Does that answer your question or not? Pick I'm going to pick another phi. I'm just going to pick another phi. OK, so. Can you get adoptive bound for the same? Very good. Uh, we're going to talk about all of that. So I'm going to show now, I'm going to give you one phi which gets you the L star. OK, the adaptivity to, to L star. And I'm give you, going to give you another phi that removes the log n. Um, so the phi that, that uh, gets you the L star is interesting because L star is uh, it's really a, a real improvement. The phi that removes the log n, even though I love to remove logs, uh, you know, the main point is that it gives you the optimal thing. And what we will see tomorrow is that it has a lot of other nice properties. OK, so that's what we will see. But let's already, let's first, you know, go slowly and, and show how other phi can give you better trade-offs between those things. So I think, yeah, given the time, for the, for the rest of the hour, we are going to stay in this simple setting where phi is just you know, a separable function. So it's a sum of uh, functions of only one variable. And tomorrow, we'll see the much more and much deeper, uh, much more interesting and much deeper case where you really need a multivariate uh, function, and, and I will explain that. And this is where like, more convex geometry is going to enter the picture. OK. So better, better mirror maps. for uh, bandit feedback. So maybe to answer your question, actually, the, this doesn't, you, you don't get the L star here, because you know this XCI got absorbed already. So how, how can we, you know, just now we can really reason about you know, the curvature of our mirror map. If we wanted to mimic what happened there, you know, and have one XTI left, what do we want? We want that the inverse second derivative should be x squared. OK, so let's do it. So 1, L star bound. So we want 1 over phi double prime of s to be s squared. Right? If we get that, then we will get that this term in expectation is exactly going to be uh, LT, just like it was here. OK, so we want this, because then, then the variance term, which is the expectation of the sum for i equals 1 to n, in this case, it would become xt i squared over L uh, over times GT I squared. This is going to be bounded by uh, the sum for I equals 1 to N of XTI LTI squared. Right? This is just exactly the same calculation as what we did. 
Now you have a square, so there is one square left, and I'm just keeping, here I removed the LTI squared, I removed it by one, here I'm just keeping it. So now I can repeat exactly the same argument. But of course, uh, I mean, I, I have to lose somewhere. I mean, otherwise, why can't I take, you know, XTI to the 100? I mean, where, where is the limit? So I need to calculate now what is the range. The range is going to be different. Okay, so, but what is the range? And what is this function anyway? So, uh, well, if I want 1 over phi double prime to be, I mean, if I want phi double prime to be 1 over s squared, I want phi prime uh, to be minus 1 over s. So I want phi to be minus log x. Okay, so phi, phi of s is equal to minus log s. Okay, so my mirror map is, quas is what's called the log barrier. So the mirror map is the log barrier. Yeah, and I realize that I forget who, who was the first one to look at this, uh, this mirror map. I'm sorry about that. This was just recently that somebody proposed this, uh, but it makes a lot of sense. Um, so what, okay, so, so there is a problem because the range is now going to be infinite. Okay, so phi of s is this thing which is uh, non-negative. So so we get that the expectation let's let's see what we get of the sum for t equals 1 to capital T lt dot xt minus y we get that this is bounded by uh, phi of y over eta plus eta over 2 lt. Right? This is like we apply directly our general theorem. We get that the regret with respect to the point y is bounded by phi of y. Okay, so the value of the mirror map at the optimum point, or maybe the optimum point, y, divided by eta plus eta over 2 times lt. Okay, so here is the point now. Phi of y, if I really put opt in there, what is opt? Opt is just, uh, you know, it has a 1 in one coordinate and 0 everywhere else. But at zeros, this is infinity. But now it's very simple. The trick is going to be, instead of putting opt, I'm going to put opt plus a little bit everywhere. And the little bit everywhere is not going to change too much the value of this thing. Okay, so instead of comparing, so... Uh, idea, instead of y, which is say 1, 0, 0, put y, which is 1, and let's say delta, delta, and maybe, you know, 1 minus, say, 1 minus delta n. Okay, so you just put a little bit of delta everywhere and you remove it from, from the optimal coordinate. The point is, the difference in, <clears throat> in value between this guy and that guy is only delta t. So if I put delta to be, you know, 1 over t squared or something, then the value of phi of y is only log 1 over delta. Okay? So what I get out of this, this implies that my regret is bounded by square root L star N log T. Okay, why do I have an N? I have an N because all, you know, I get a log T from every coordinate. Okay, so you see, it's pretty funny now. You, you see something interesting, which is I have changed the balance of range and variance. Before, the variance was a term n. Here, it's the range which has a, a term n. 
Okay, so again, I flipped from having a variance uh, which was n and a range which was like log n to now something where the variance is like 1, or in fact even like the loss of the algorithm, but the range is like n. So maybe I can do a better trade-off in between. So that's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to do a better trade-off in between, which will allow me to remove this log n. Oh, and I, I didn't say, but of course, uh, phi triple prime is, uh, is negative. Okay, so I can literally apply everything. Phi tri triple prime is negative. I mean, I, I don't cheat. Like, everything is, uh, is correct. Okay, so again, so far, entropy gives for the uh, range variance uh, trade off. Okay, so I have phi double prime inverse. So phi double prime inverse in this case is x. My range is like log n, and my variance is like n. Now if I put x squared, OK, so this is the log barrier. If I put x squared, then I get n for the range up to a log t, let's say n log t. Uh, yeah, n log t. And here I get 1. What? Why oh, x log x? Uh, uh, x log x, interesting. Uh, I was thinking more like uh, x to the 3 half. You know, something in between. Uh, yeah, x log x is a fun idea also. What would it be? OK, let's see after. Uh, so idea. Uh, x to the 3 half. OK, so what we will see right now, OK, so right, x to the 3 halves, this is between x and, uh, and x squared. Something that seems reasonable. So what we will see is that in this case, we're going to get, so I, I spoil you the answer, we're going to get square root 10, square root 10. OK, so this, this will imply that the regret is bounded by square root nt up to some constant. OK, and this is, uh, this is an idea of uh, Jean-Yves Audibert and myself uh, in 2009, and then uh, with Gabor Lugosi in uh, 2011 for the mirror descent interpretation. Uh, OK, so let's see it. So if I want 1 over, I mean, if I want phi double prime of s to be 1 over x to the 3 half, then up to a constant phi of s, what is it? So you know, phi prime is going to be minus, phi prime is going to be uh, one over, minus 1 over square root x. Yeah, so phi of s is going to be minus square root x. Okay, phi, phi s is minus square root s. Okay, so it's kind of a funny regularizer. Uh, it's like the mirror map itself is the L1 half norm. But the L1 half norm is concave, so we take minus the L1 half norm. What, what say again? Uh, so this is called the Tsalis entropy, actually. So this is what uh, Jake Abernathy taught me, that this has a name. 
Sally's entropy. Basically, you can look at, instead of, say, 3 half, you can look at 1 plus epsilon. And when epsilon goes to 0, you get back the entropy. But for other values of epsilon, you get something else. Uh, OK, so let's just do the calculation. So note that phi triple, triple prime of s is, again, uh, non-positive. So I can literally apply directly our general theorem. I don't have to do, to do anything. Right? So what do I get? And this is uh, negative. So yeah. So I get that my regret is bounded by, because it's negative, I just get minus phi of x1 over eta plus eta uh, over 2, the sum for t equals 1 to capital T. Uh, what do I get? I get xi t to the 3 half, right, and an expectation here, uh, gi t squared. And what is this again? So the lit squared is going to disappear. It's bounded by 1. Then I have 1 over xit squared times the indicator. So the indicator in expectation, it removes 1 of the xit squared. So I have 1 over xit, which is going to cancel one of those ones. So I get that this is bounded by uh, minus phi of x1 over eta plus eta over 2, the sum for t equals 1 to capital T of the sum for i equals 1 to t of square root xit. OK, and this square root is, gonna, is very important both right now but also tomorrow for adaptivity. Now I can just uh, i equals 1 to n. By Jensen, the sum of the square root xi, or Cauchy-Schwarz maybe, is smaller than square root of n times the sum of the xi. Okay, so this is smaller than square root n, just by Cauchy-Schwarz. But minus phi of x1, what is this? This is also the sum of the square root of x1i. Okay, so it's also bounded by square root n. Okay, and again, different values of 3, if instead of 3 half I put 1 plus epsilon, I, I would just get different trade off range variance, but they all give you square root nt. OK, and in fact, maybe we can even write down the constant just to be uh, clear. So it's going to be square root 2. OK, any, any question on this, on what we did today? OK, so these were examples of just simple mirror maps, separable mirror maps. But you see, there is already some variety. It's not just the boring entropy all the time. Um, you get different kind of results. Some of them give you this first order bound. Some of them remove the log n. Um, so what we're going to see tomorrow, we're going to see two things. One of them is, again, this more interesting case where you really need to use the full power of multivariate uh, mirror maps. So that will be the first hour. And in the second hour, I will show some surprising adaptivity properties of this mirror map, which we, again, don't understand the full scope of it. And, uh, and I will try to explain that. Okay, so again, any question? If not, uh, I think we're done for the day. Yeah? yeah. One question. In the bound you had before, you had a log t in the... Yes. Yes. So could you comment briefly on why you would prefer to have to re remove the square root n, uh, the log n, instead of keeping the log t? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so here, in this n log t, here I, wrote, I just wrote 1 for the variance. But in fact, it wasn't 1. The variance was really 
lt dot x, I mean, which is bounded by one, but it's more interesting. So this gives you, this gives you the small loss. This gives you our t is bounded by square root n l star log t. So you can ask, can you remove this log t? Uh, I do not know the answer, but I think, uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, I actually, the question was more, why would you prefer to have the square root of t in the second bound than the Ah, I see, I see, I see, I see. Excellent. Uh, you don't prefer it. Uh, I mean, but that the beauty, kind of the beauty of mathematics is that uh, this is useless as a result per se. I mean, it seems like this is just strictly better. Who cares about the log t, as you say? Usually, you know, L star might be a bit smaller, and this will be always preferred. But what we're going to see tomorrow is that this actually is super adaptive in another way. So, it, yeah, but it's a very good comment. You're right. Yeah. Anything else? Let's stop for the day. Thanks. <laughs>